This is the MedicCast, June 6th, 2011. Transmitters? We don't need no stinking transmitters. This is the MediCast, a podcast for EMS providers by EMS providers, featuring EMS news, products, tips, tricks, and commentary. So grab your gear and glove up. Here's today's show with the pod medic, Jamie Davis. Well, good day and welcome to this week's episode of The Medic Cast. I'm your host, Jamie Davis, The Pod Medic, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the program this week. If you haven't already done so, please make sure you take some time this week. Head over to mediccast.com slash blog. While you're there, you'll find links to everything discussed in this and every other episode, as well as other articles, information, study tips, and a whole lot more, all available over at the Medic Cast site. So I hope you'll head over there and check it out. Again, mediccast.com slash blog. If you'd like to get back in touch with me, you can always send me an email, podmedic at mac.com, or call in on the voicemail line, 941-306-3342, 941-30-MEDIC. And if you want to catch up with me on Facebook or Twitter, you can find me under the handle podmedic there, twitter.com slash podmedic and facebook.com slash podmedic. Let's jump on in and uh, chat with some of the listener mail that we've received recently, and that's coming right up. Let's take a quick moment and look at some of the listener contacts I've gotten. I say contacts because I'm not covering email this time. We're looking at the Facebook page. A lot of people have been sending me some messages there, and I thought I would just go back through and follow up with some of them. Um, I heard from listener Chaz basically checking in just to say, thanks, love the podcast. And um, hey, Chaz, thanks a lot to you uh, and continue listening. And I hope you'll continue to share the show with people you know and continue to grow the the MedicCast community. Uh, This is a community effort and I appreciate all of you and I really appreciate uh, you all taking the time to check in like Chaz has. Uh, I hear these kind of comments from all of you quite frequently and I gotta say it, it, it helps you know, make the work of putting the show together a little bit easier when I when I hear from you that, you know, I've had a positive effect on your school, on your motivation to work harder or do a better job as a patient care provider, uh, whatever the case may be, just it means that we're doing the right thing here on the show and it means I'm on track. So I appreciate that, Chaz, and, and thanks a lot for checking in. I also heard from listener Adrian, uh, it's been a while ago, but Adrian and I have been, have been checking back and forth on Facebook, and uh, Adrian's a, a colleague of Rick Rosati's up uh, in New York. Of course, Rick, the host of the Mitigation Journal podcast, and we always love to have Rick here on the show and uh, check with him periodically when we have things to talk about regarding preparedness. You know, Adrian was... Um, checking in and uh, just letting letting me know that uh, that uh, there was some value to the medic cast and also sharing quite a few links on some upcoming things including um, some information on ultrasound applications in EMS um, we've covered Adrian Adrian just to let you know we've covered ultrasound here on the show um, talked about its uses and applications I'm really interested in checking in with some of the folks over at uh, my contacts at physio control because I've um, been talking with them about implementation of uh, of um, of sonography in uh, something like their LifePak 15. Uh, You know, it's becoming a mobile ER, basically, you know, something you can carry around with you that's got all these diagnostic tools on it. And that would be really great if we could add something like a a portable sonogram device to that to uh, manage our patients and look for different things. And not just looking for the obvious things that we might see in a trauma like a belly bleed, but we can identify triple A's, we can identify certain kind of cardiac problems and conditions, pneumothorax, there's a lot of things we can do with an ultrasound. Um, we can detect pulses um, where we couldn't palpate a pulse. We can detect pulses and, and things like that uh, using those devices. So I'm really excited that we might get those devices on the units. And Adrian, as always, keep sending links in and keep in contact and let me know how things are going with you and uh, getting back up to speed. I am looking forward to hearing from you again. So check back in. That's it. Uh, Again, if you want to catch up with me, you know, send an email in. 
podmedic at mac.com. You can also check in with me using the Facebook fan page or using the, my Facebook page, facebook.com slash podmedic, uh, twitter.com slash podmedic, however you want to follow and check in with me. I try to get back to each and every one of you, and hopefully I will be able to uh, share some of your comments here on the show at a future time. So get in touch with me and become a more active part of the MedicCast community. Let's take a look at this week's news, and uh, click, kicking off this week's news is uh, a kudos event here at the MedicCast. Every time, uh, you know, sometimes when I see some articles that, you know, say, hey, good job, um, I want to say so out loud. Um, and this is not that unusual, uh, not something that we would, any of us would not do ourselves, I think, but it's still great to see that it made the news and it just again points out why I'm proud to be part of the emergency services community. Um, a firefighter paramedic was out, um, was out uh, catching fish, fishing with his buddies um, on a nearby river to his community when he noticed a mother of a toddler um, frantically waving for help and calling for help. Her child had fallen in the river and had, was no longer breathing. Um, the paramedic and his buddy immediately headed to shore and uh, he began to uh, resuscitate this patient. So, you know, I just want to say um, kudos to Joel Arnier. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. But uh, Joel, you know, I can't say enough about uh, when we do it right. And even though you weren't on duty, you saw a duty and a need to act and you took care of the problem. And, uh, you know, this child will live a long time uh, grateful and thankful and her family thankful that you were there to help rescue her uh, and resuscitate her when she had this drown near drowning event. And um, so just kudos to you. And, uh, you know, these are opportunities for us to show off the good things we do in the community. So when somebody does something like this in your service, are you getting the information out there and doing a press release on it? Um, this is something that agencies should be doing more of to promote what we do and to point out that, you know, we're not just paramedics and on the job. We take that calling that need to help others home with us in everything we do. And, and I think that uh, it's something that is what makes us uh, an integral part of the healthcare, uh, healthcare situation in this country, uh, both good and bad in some ways. But it certainly does mean that we uh, provide a valuable service to the community. And this is just an indication of one, one of the ways that valuable service happens. We have, uh, because we're part of the community, we're able to help even when we're not on duty. And I think that's important to note. And so kudos to Joel and uh, look forward to more articles like this. Uh, Medicast gives us, gives a big hats off to this guy uh, for doing his job, even when it wasn't on the job. Now we go from that to this bizarre story I picked up out of the UK. This is from dailymail.co.uk and it is a paramedic who allegedly faked emergency calls because his girlfriend was a dispatcher and giving her some interesting calls was a way to get her to look good. I'm just going to wait for a moment while you digest that. Uh, you really need to check this article out for yourself, and there will be a link in the show notes. But basically, uh, this paramedic, who, by the way, is married, um, <laughs> went ahead and um, this guy by the name of Simon Surplus allegedly uh, told his girlfriend that uh, he would do anything to help her get statistics, and then he would log in and fake like thre life-threatening incidents uh, being called into the system. Uh, you know, folks... <laughs> We're busy enough as it is. I can't imagine there are services out there that really need to generate call volume to make ourselves look good. Uh, needless to say, this is just reprehensible. So we go from a paramedic who does everything right and is just doing a great job and makes us all look good to this guy who, according to what he allegedly did, is making us all look bad because he was getting a little something something on the side. So I... I I just want to point out that, you know, folks, what you do in your spare time is all fine and dandy and, and entirely up to you. You've got to live your life. I get it. But you don't do that. You don't bring it into the workplace and make everybody's lives different and difficult because you want to make call volume look better for your girlfriend. Uh, I'm sorry. Just 
don't even get me started. Um, but this bizarre article, you really need to check out and read the whole thing to yourself. And you'll say there's a disciplinary hearing pending for this individual, as I would think we would all expect. Um, but anyway, just want to check in and uh, let you know uh, about this particular article, because it was one of the more bizarre articles I found when looking for news recently. Finally, the last news item is a great article about campus EMS programs. Um, we've talked about this before. We've had the National, um, National, EMS, uh, National Student EMS Foundation, um, and it is the, um, the National Collegiate EMS Foundation, NCEMSF. Um, I have to remember these acronyms. But anyway, we've had them on the show. I've been to their conference in the past. Uh, and I have to say it's a great opportunity to see what's going on. And uh, these are really active and energetic med um, professionals training in, in a small community-based environment. You know, I mean, a lot of us in small rural communities can probably make a lot of um, uh, corollaries to what it's like to be in this situation. But think about this. We're talking about a, a, a small, close-knit group of relatively small, close-knit population, people all about the same age, and they live close together in tight-packed housing situations, and similar-sized communities that have a small EMS service might be more, much more spread out in a rural area, but in this situation, they might be just in a, a small grouping of several city blocks, and that certainly makes it difficult for um, patients uh, when you know the patients and you run into them in class the next day. Um, so we've had discussions with these folks. I, I Hats off to them. And there's a great article from the Boston College Chronicle about their student EMS program, the Eagle EMS program, that contributes 4,200 hours of voluntary service to the Boston College community. Uh, and in some cases, these services act as mutual aid services to surrounding communities as well. So really an integral part of the overall EMS response system. And I hope that we'll be able to, um, to hear more from them in the future. I'm sure that's the case. Uh, there's a lot to be said for what these guys are doing, uh, ladies, guys and ladies are doing, to uh, bring good EMS service to their communities, just like the rest of us are doing. If you'd like to find any of the links to these articles, you can find them over at mediccast.com slash blog. Follow the link to the show notes pages, and you can go ahead and find anything there. Of course, you can also search. So if you need to search for some of the keywords in the articles, that might help you find a particular article linked to on the website. If you have any problems with that, you can always get back in touch with me, podmedic at mac.com, and shoot me an email and let me know, and I will get back to you and let you know how to work that out. Time now for this week's tip of the week, and this is going to be another segment with our good friend Lisa Booz from the Maryland Poison Center. She's joining us again. This uh, segment, of course, previously recorded via a phone conversation, but Lisa came back to share with us some thoughts and some best practices for dealing with inhalant overdoses and inhalant abuse, how to recognize it and things like that. Uh, as always, I want to thank Lisa for making time out of her busy schedule, sharing her expertise with toxicology subjects with us and making us better at what we do. And of course, you can find more from Lisa and the rest of the folks over at the Maryland Poison Center at mdpoison.com. And uh, if you, you don't have to be from the state of Maryland to get that information and they make it readily available. And I know they're, they're always telling me how glad they are to be able to share information via the show. And I just, I'm right back at them with, hey, you know, I know that I love to have that information on the show as well. And so without further ado, let's jump into this recent segment on inhalant abuse with Lisa Booz from the Maryland Poison Center. This is Jamie Davis, the pod medic, back with another segment with Lisa Booz from the Maryland Poison Center. And I'm really curious what Lisa's going to bring for us this month. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Jamie. So what well, are we going to be talking about? Well, this month, um, I thought I'd talk about inhalants. Um, inhalants have been around for a long, long time, and it certainly has been a problem in our youth as well as adults. Um, but it, the popularity kind of waxes and wanes over the years, so it's important to keep on top of this and know 
uh, about inhalant abuse, what products there are, and also um, the toxic effects of these inhalants. If, if you look in every home in our country, you're likely to find at least one of the thousands of household products that are commonly inhaled by, by children, teens, and adults to get high. Uh, studies have shown that there are more than 22 million Americans that have used inhalants to get high at least once in their lifetime, and that includes more than 15% of eighth graders when they're uh, surveyed. Inhalants are often the first drug or substance that young people try, and children as, as young as, si as six or eight years of age use inhalants, with peak usage occurring somewhere between ages 14 and 17. So often it's the um, first product that's used. It's, um, if you just think about it, the products are, that are inhaled are readily accessible, they're inexpensive, they're legal to buy, and they're very easy to hide. Unfortunately, many adults, parents, and children have no idea how dangerous these chemicals can be. They can be used in several different ways. The inhaler um, or user can inhale the chemical directly from the container by holding it up to their mouth or nose, or sometimes they'll actually spray it directly into the mouth or nose. Huffing is actually when the product sprayed or poured onto something like a cloth, and the cloth is then either stuffed into the mouth or held up to the nose and the mouth, and then the user inhales the chemical off of the rag. Um, or the, the product can be sprayed into a plastic bag, and then the user inhales it from the bag. Some of the most common products that are inhaled are gasoline, lighter fluid, paint, dry cleaning fluids, paint thinner, air freshener, glues, shoe polishes, correction fluids, and computer duster sprays are very popular now as inhalants. Nitrous oxides also commonly abused, and usually it's, it's uh, uh, sprayed or, or let loose into a balloon, and then the user inhales it from a balloon. Nitrous oxides, otherwise known as laughing gas, it's an anesthetic that's often used in dental offices, but it's also found in whipped cream canisters, and it's commonly called whippets when it's used from this whipped cream canister. All of the products contain volatile solvents and aerosols, and what they, what they do is they displace oxygen in the lungs or they're absorbed through the lungs to, and to uh, decrease oxygen to the brain. Uh, by decreasing the oxygen to the brain, the patient will become lightheaded and they'll develop some euphoria, and often they'll also develop impaired judgment and impulsive behaviors. The effects start immediately after inhaling the product, and they only last a few minutes. There are central nervous system depressants, so soon after the high, users often fall asleep. Often they'll have the um, paraphernalia, uh, cans, products right there next to them uh, asleep on the, on the floor. And seizures can occur from cerebral hypoxia. Some other products that are abused are sold as deodorizers and liquid incense, but they're abused primarily as sexual enhancers. They contain nitrites, amyl nitrite, butyl nitrite, and isobutyl nitrite. Now, these liquid nitrites come in very small bottles, and they go by the slang terms rush, poppers, snappers, and there are a lot of other names. The nitrites act really differently than the other inhalants. They're a lot like nitroglycerin. They're vasodilators, so they cause a warm, flushing feeling, and people describe that as a rush. The heart rate can, can increase while the blood pressure decreases, and people usually complain of a pretty bad headache. A dangerous effect that can occur with the nitrites is something called methemoglobinemia, and that's when the hemoglobin in the body is bound up and can't carry oxygen to tissues and organs. Chronic users of all of these types of inhalants are at risk for multiple medical problems, and, and those medical problems include central nervous system impairment. That results usually in personality changes, memory loss, lack of coordination, tremors, and also some vision loss and hearing loss. But these products also can affect other organ systems like the liver, the kidneys, the heart, and the lungs. Now, people do die from inhalants, and deaths occur primarily due to a phenomenon known as sudden sniffing death. The chemicals in these inhalants sensitize the heart to endogenous epinephrine, so an epinephrine that's already in your body, and that results in sudden and often fatal arrhythmias, mainly ventricular fibrillation. It's very unpredictable. It can occur with the first use of inhalant, or it can occur after many years of abusing inhalants. Victims collapse suddenly, and resuscitation efforts are often unsuccessful, unfortunately. Deaths also can occur from suffocation, asphyxiation, from seizures, from aspiration uh, after the, the person vomits, from trauma events, and also from fires. Remember, many of the chemicals are flammable. 
So how can you tell if someone's been using an inhalant where there, there's some, um, there are some telltale clues? There might be pain around the mouth. There might be stains on the clothes or, or uh, there might be containers and bags or rags lying nearby. There's often a chemical odor on the breath or on the patient. Uh, these solvents are also irritating to mucous membranes and skin, so users might have red eyes, a runny nose, and they might have a rash around the mouth and the nose. A patient can look dazed or drunk, or he might be irritable and agitated. There's no specific treatment for inhalant abusers. In, in most cases, the effects have worn off before EMS arrives or before the patient arrives at the emergency department. If the patient is seizing, anticonvulsants are given. If the patient has collapsed and is cardiac arrest, then obviously all resuscitation efforts should be attempted. And don't forget to consult with the poison center on inhalant cases. All poison centers in the United States can be reached by calling 1-800-222-1222. Finally, we all have opportunities uh, to educate the public about the dangers of inhalants, studies actually do show that the use of inhalants decreases when more youth perceive inhalants to be dangerous. And this has been shown following widespread education efforts. There are several resources and organizations that have a wealth of information and educational materials about inhalants. Um, so, Jamie, what I'd like to do, if, if you would, is, is to post these websites on, on your website, these um, um, organization so that listeners can go to them to get more information on inhalants as well as the materials to help them educate the public. Oh, absolutely. And, and definitely we'll, we'll include those links in the show notes for this episode. And I'm um, sure they can probably also find those links directly by contacting their local poison centers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or even just Googling inhalants, you'd probably come up with a number of these websites also. They're very active organizations. They do a lot of good work. They have a lot of resources for healthcare providers to use. And, and they can, so then our listeners can go and uh, check in directly with uh, the local uh, schools or community organizations and provide educational materials directly to their communities uh, as they see, you know, flare-ups of inhalant abuse. That, that's exactly right. Um, one of the organizations in particular is called the Alliance for Consumer Education. And um, this organization has put together sort of a teacher's kit, um, a lot of resources about inhalants. And some states have made this mandatory to teach either to the children in their school systems or like in our state in Maryland, it's, uh, it was uh, a law was passed a few years ago to um, or I guess a regulation, not really a law, to um, use these materials in the school systems um, so that people within the school systems or within the schools themselves can actually then teach the parents about inhalants. So there's different ways of educating. We need to educate the educators, we need to educate the parents, and we also need to educate the children. And we'll take care of educating some of the healthcare professionals too. So that'll, that'll be a, a, a hat trick, I guess, or whatever. That's right. <laughs> well, Lisa, thanks a lot, and uh, we'll look forward to your next segment next month. Thanks, Jamie. And that's going to wrap up this week's episode of The MedicCast. I want to thank everybody for checking out the show this week and remind you to head over to MedicCast.com slash blog. And you'll find links to everything we talked about in this episode's show notes link. You can find the show notes pages linked right at the top of the page. And you'll find the most recent episode listed first there. You can scroll down and find other episodes. So take some time and follow up on the information from the news or from the tip of the week that is provided there. And I always try to make sure there's good links to credible resources so that you can go even farther in depth beyond the 10 or 15 minute overview that we give here on the show. And then always, always make sure you look carefully at your protocols, your instructional guidelines, and, and what you need to know so that you can appropriately adapt it to your own scope of practice. And of course, follow your own scope of practice whenever that conflicts with what I have to say, because that comes first. In the meantime, I do want to remind you to get back in touch with me if you have any comments or questions. If there's a correction, if I screwed up, please let me know. You can go ahead and send those emails in to podmedic at mac.com. You can also call in on the voicemail line, 941 306 3342 medic and I will get back to you. I love to hear from each and every one of you, no matter how you contact me, so keep those contacts and comments coming in. You can also reach me here on Facebook or Twitter, 
Facebook.com slash Podmedic, Twitter.com slash Podmedic, and of course the MedicCast fan page. We're approaching 2,500 fans, and I'd like you to be part of that first 2,500 fans. So if you haven't already done so, visit Facebook.com slash MedicCast and become a fan of the show over at the MedicCast. Um, you can click the like button at the top of the page, and then, you know, when I put updates over there, a lot of times I'll share links over on the MedicCast page because I'm not going to write a full blog post on it, but I wanted to make sure that the information was getting out to the fans and you can get that information just by becoming a fan of the show it'll show up in your Facebook feed so now before we head out I don't want to forget our song for the week um, we got a song from Bo Hall and it's a song called Super Hot Lady Cup um, all right, a little tongue in cheek, but it's a great funk number. I mean, I'm, I'm all about the funk, you know. So anyway, just check it out. You'll find a link to Berman's, uh, Bo Hall's music in the show notes, and you can link and let him know you heard it here on the Medic Cast. And if you like the songs, hey, pick them up over in iTunes. There's a link to do that as well. That's it. I'm Jamie Davis, the Pod Medic. I'll be back again soon with another episode here of the Medic Cast. In the meantime, please remember to keep in mind Scene safety, BSI. Super hot lady cop. Don't want a ticket, I can't pay the fine. Don't wanna go to call mama, I ain't got the time But this lady cop is driving me, driving me, driving me out of my mind Won't you stop writing that ticket? Won't this hundred help you change your mind? What you doing with them now? Handcuffs, you pretty lady. I thought that you and me could reach a compromise. Super hot lady cop. Mama, you're out so fine. Super hot lady cop. Super hot lady cop. You catch me ever. You got my license and my registration Say I got me going close to 69 That might be illegal in 47 states <laughs> I can't help myself, mama, you're so fine Super hot lady cop Mama, you're so
cop. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. That was good. Uh huh. Uh huh. No. Nope. Come on, one time. Huh? Super hot lady cop. I feel super hot lady cop. You said it. I said it. Super hot lady cop.